30 and we start on time 7 30. um welcome everyone um i have to say i am not overly organized tonight and um mary perhaps you could tell everyone what's coming up yes so uh next week we have a separate program if but if you're interested it's an introduction to the revamped usdf instructor trainer development program that is the separate registration for next Monday. And then in two weeks, we're back with this program again um, with Dr. Heather Beach on tendons and ligaments. I highly recommend the program next week. I think the Instructor Trainer Council, which has a new name now, um, has done a really good job of putting together a new educational um, session for everyone, not just those wanting to become instructors. Um, we have, uh, as usual, we've had sponsorship from Trafalgar Square, who has been so generous to dressage for kids over the years. And um, there will be a drawing at the end. Uh, you have to be present. Uh, Mary has all of the names of people that are on uh, for a gift certificate to Trafalgar Square, which is their website is horseandriderbooks.com, I believe. Um, if you want books, that's the place to go, equestrian books. And I think that's all we need to chat about so we can get right on to our program with Ann Guptel, who's a professional FEI level dressage rider and trainer. Ann was a member of the 1987 USET silver medal dressage team that placed uh, fourth in the league finals of the Volvo, and wait, placed fourth in the US league finals of the Volvo World Cup in 1990 and 91 and was long listed with the U.S. equestrian team from 87 to 92. And is a USDF gold, silver, and bronze medalist, a USDF L judge graduate, a USDF certified instructor, and examiner for the USDF instructor certification program. And is a graduate A traditional of the U.S. Pony Club and has enjoyed volunteering and mentoring others in the U.S. Pony Club. Together with her family, Ann owns and operates Fox Ledge Farm in East Haddam, Connecticut. In addition, she and her husband, Ed, also create dressage musical freestyles with their equestrian arts productions. And I think was one of the very early people to design freestyles for people. And enjoys teaching riders of all levels and disciplines and works with horses of all breeds and types. I'm really pleased to say she's going to be here this evening. She's certainly a woman of many talents and much experience. So, Anne, I hand this over to you. Thank you, Lyndon. And thank you for providing this opportunity. I think this is a great platform and it has made um, education so much more accessible for everyone. So welcome everyone. I see 50 participants. Um, I would like to use this PowerPoint that was compiled by Mary Al Barnett. Mary Al was also a certification examiner and had many other hats as well and was a very active judge. I really like using the pyramid of training or training scale. The USDF revamped it as the pyramid of training when they did a uh, revision of wording, just to make the wording a little bit more uh, user-friendly and um, present in the, more in the present tense of how people use dressage terminology. And Mary, I think there may be time at the end for questions, am I right? Yes, time at the end for questions. And if anyone wants to, um, if anyone has a question, just write it in the chat and we'll pull questions from there. Okay, all right, I am good to go. So, <clears throat> so we use the pyramid of training to evaluate and educate. So evaluate. Each time we watch a horse in training, in work, we look at where to assess. So as an instructor or a trainer to assess where are they in the scale of training or pyramid of training, what piece of that pyramid may be missing or may need improvement. And the image of pyramid, I like because it has the broad base and on the base is the rhythm. As without good rhythm, cannot have really good dressage. And if you look up the scale, the peak, of course, is the collection. The important piece to remember 
is that without all the previous elements, you cannot have true collection. So without good straightness, there's not true collection. Without impulsion, there is not collection. Without a good connection and without relaxation, of course, if the rhythm is impaired by any of the work, that has to be addressed first. On the sides of the image here, physical development on the left through progressive conditioning, understanding that it takes a long time to truly collect a horse and then bring the horse up through the levels with good collection. Collection starting at true collection, starting at second level and increased requirements as the levels proceed. Um, on the other side, on the right-hand side, increased throughness and obedience. Um, obedience may be better phrased as lack of resistance um, or the happy athlete is important, increased throughness and obedience. So when we look at a horse overall, we look at their whole outline, how they're carrying themselves, how their muscles are working through their body, how their rider is interacting with them. I think we can go to the next slide, which this will then go through all the pieces. So again, Marielle indicates that this is a guideline. The, I, the elements are all interrelated and it's important that they go in order. Um, some are interchangeable at times, but no matter what the level of the training of the horse needs to be followed. And I love that it is universal and classical dressage. So. The wonderful thing about dressage is you should be able to go ride a horse that is well-trained anywhere and classical principles apply to all the horses, regardless of their level of training. And this is a daily, this is what we, we live by, the pyramid of training, the scale of training. So Marielle has some great graphics here. This is a lovely picture of the stallion briar. So elements of rhythm. But if you look at the overall picture of the horse, really nothing to fault here. It's in a lovely piaf. He has good elevation, good sitting with the hind leg that's on the ground, soft in the bridle, the rider sitting lightly and quiet. So she uses this photo again later. Of course, hard to see rhythm in a standing photo, a still photo, but you can see there are clear diagonal pairs there. So rhythm with energy and tempo. Energy and tempo are what we need for impulsion. This PowerPoint is broken down with descriptions of how to evaluate the rhythm, a pure walk, a pure trot, a pure canter. Then as the horse progresses with the dressage, those gates are expressed with energy. And she reminds us that consistent tempo, because if a horse speeds up, the tempo is too fast. They're very often tense. If they slow down too much and tempo is too slow, there's likely not enough activity. And then throughout evaluating a horse, remains in balance, self-carriage appropriate to the level of training. And we'll get into that a little bit more later as far as relative and absolute elevation. So appropriate to the level of training when you're evaluating the horse. So pure gates, the walk has four beats, no period of suspension. Start, if you start with the left hind, the foot falls, four beats are left hind, left front, right hind, right front. And she gives some good graphics <clears throat> in the next few slides that show those footfalls. We do not, some of them are a little bit technical because again, Marielle uh, approaches this also from the judge's perspective. But 4B, no period of suspension is what's really important to understand in the walk. With no period of suspension, that is what, the reason that some of the faults of the walk can come in and the reason the walk can be difficult. No aerial phase. That's the same as no period of suspension. So here on the reading the screen from the left with the illustration, first beat is left hind, second beat left front, third beat right hind, fourth beat right front. So one, two, three, four. And regular, one, two, three, four. Irregular would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
So one, two, three, four, equal time and space between each footfall. So faults of the walk. What does this walk look like? It's not one, two, three, four, is it? This is an illustration of this camel with bridalis with a lateral walk. You see the pairs are not correct. There should be four separate footfalls and this has two. Okay, so a lateral walk can also be called a pace. So lateral is if you do not have the separation of the four beats. There are two things, uneven and unlevel, and they're slightly different. So uneven is that the length of the strides are not the same. So if you're watching the horse walk past you, look for those four footfalls and look at the over tracking of the hind leg stepping past the print of the front foot. If one hind leg does not track up the same as the other hind leg, the horse is uneven in the walk. Unlevel, the height of the strides. So if you think of levelness as in how high the horse picks the, it up, evenness as in how far it steps forward. And those are, those are important things to remember how to express because it's really important that we all use correct terminology so we're understood by others if speaking about it. So this is where it can get a list, this presentation can get a little bit technical, but it's very interesting to start to train your eye and learning to train your eye is really important. Um, you know, dressage is really not like watching grass grow when you watch what happens with the body of the horse and watch what happens with the body of the rider and how they interact. So this shows a regular rhythm, like we said before, one, two, three, four. Okay, and then one again is the right hind again. Okay, equal number of spaces between each beat. So when the horse is lateral, and this is an interesting illustration, look at how high that horse's neck is, how much he's using his under neck, and that could be one of the limiting factors that's not allowing his feet to have four equal beats, okay? That hollowness, how the horse uses their neck and their back in the walk can affect how they travel in the walk, okay? Draft horse, very different. But if you look at how the feet are on the ground, on the draft, you can see that it's lateral, okay? Because there are two feet about the same amount off the ground and two feet pretty flat on the ground, okay? You look above it again to the gray horse with the rider, the two feet on the ground are the two outside feet, two feet off the ground are the two inside feet. So that's why that's called lateral couplets because they're on the same side. The legs that are on the ground are on the same side, the legs that are lifted are on the same side. The diagonal couplets, two diagonal pairs are equal. And here comes the trot bouncing in and a gorgeous baby with good overstep. Look at that, how much reach he has behind and how parallel his diagonal pairs are. That as a free, young horse free, he's using his body really quite lovely there. Symmetrical, diagonal pairs are equal. Two beats, recognizable in the still photo, two beats. Leaping gait, that means that there's airtime, there's a period of suspension, and that photo there catches that period of suspension. Synchronously, meaning that diagonal pairs work fairly equally. Okay, the aerial phrase is the period of suspension. Okay, faults in the trot. A four beat trot, that's a pretty awful trot. If you're four beats, there's not a period of suspension. Passage like steps, people have to be careful of this because some get fooled into thinking that a passage trot is collected trot. Um, and if it's floaty, but it doesn't have activity behind and doesn't have equal pushing power behind, or loses its diagonal pairs, 
it, the passage-like steps are not correct. Same with unevenness and unlevelness, evenness being the reach, levelness being the height. Canter start can be a little more difficult to evaluate. The trot with two equal beats can be pretty straightforward to learn how to evaluate. The canter with its three beats, the leading hind leg, the striking off hind leg, the diagonal pair, and then the landing leading front leg, okay? Six phases, again, here this can get a little bit complicated, but the emphasized beat, would you call the emphasized beat the first beat or the third beat? The most recognizable one is the third beat because that's when the leading front leg hits the ground. And that is the leg that we align in musical freestyles to for the beat of the canter to match the beat of the music. Okay, so here asymmetrical is not a bad word. Okay, asymmetrical because the three beats are different. Trot is symmetrical, two diagonal pairs. Walk is symmetrical, four equal beats. Canter with three beats is asymmetrical, okay? Leaping gait, meaning there's a period of suspension. Don't worry about the high-tech descriptions. Aerial phase, period of suspension, follows the lift off of the leading front leg. So it's one, two, three, and, okay? One, outside hind, two, diagonal pair, inside hind, outside front, three, inside front, leading front leg, and is the period of suspension. So it can also have lateral problems in the canter. This starts to become a little more technical, negative dissociation. That means the front leg hits the ground first. Okay, think about that, how on the forehand that is if the front leg hits the ground first. Lack of suspension, no period of suspension, the canter then kind of use, loses its beauty. A lack of spread between the hind legs. So when you watch a horse cantering, let's see if we get a picture. Do we have a picture of a horse in a good canter? Mm, not yet. Okay. So if we find a picture of a horse in a good canter, I'm going to scoot back to where we were, because that's a gallop there where that horse is a little open. And this is not, okay. So back to discussion of the canter. Lack of spread between the hind legs. Picture a horse cantering. You'd like to see the inside hind leg swing well under the body. So that separates it from the outside hind leg, okay? Outside hind leg strikes off, then the diagonal pair inside hind, outside front. And you wanna see a real reach of that inside hind. Okay, we're moving on from rhythm. We have our three pure gates, walk, trot, canter. And we keep our three pure gates throughout all of our training sessions. If we do not, we reassess what we're doing, find the rhythm, relaxation. So we would like the work to allow the horse to become relaxed in the work. So relaxation, there's mental relaxation and physical relaxation. So the mental state, <clears throat> anxiousness, um, nervousness. The physical state, when you look at the horse, again, that beautiful picture of Briar doing the Piaf, you could see that his muscles are relaxed, active, but relaxed. And you could see in that picture, him accepting the influence of his rider, not tense. Positive muscle tone, elasticity, supple swinging back, all those good things, okay? When you are looking at the horse, evaluating the horse, the muscles on this horse look engaged, working, but soft, not tense. Remember the picture of the lateral walk with the horse in the, the white horse in the tack inverted how hollow his neck was. So this horse's neck is lifted from the withers and from the hind legs rather than lifted from the under neck. Even though he's a stallion and has a very prominent stallion crest and neck, his neck is soft. So when you look at the musculature, you want to see engagement without tension. Of course, there's always some tension. There has to be positive tension for the muscles to work. So expression. Besides looking at the musculature of the horse and how the horse is working, expression. 
expression of the eyes and ears. This kitten's almost even smiling. Tail swings, chewing on the bit with the mouth not open. And then that rhythmic snort or blowing often is found in the or heard in the canter with the exhale. The snort can help emphasize that. So if we look back at Briar's picture, you can see that there is some um, foam in his mouth, some saliva. You can see that the reins are not taut. You can see his tail is held away, but not swishing. His ears are turned back towards his rider. So eyes, ears, mouth, tail can really show you or indicate what the horse's relaxed state is. Okay. Now, clearly this horse is connected, but in a light contact. So the leg goes to the hand, the hand connects back to the seat and coming up, we'll have a slide that shows that. Here we go. The circle of the aids, okay? And here she refers to acceptance of the, the bit through acceptance of the aids. And look at the arrows and look at the musculature and the highlights of the musculature of the horse. So here we are clearly in trot, two beat diagonal pairs. The rider is sitting in a good vertical balance, vertical alignment. The horse is in the contact, is open, his throat latch is open, his nose is out to the bit, but the leg sends the horse forward. So you see the arrow that goes forward through the horse's shoulder. That energy goes up through the horse's neck, through the horse's jaw and pull into the bridle. The rider takes an elastic feel in the contact. That energy flows back through the rider's elbow, arm, back, and seat into the horse's back, back through the horse's hindquarters and right back around. So the circle of the aids is complete. You don't see any blockage. You don't see resistance. You see a flow when you watch the horse move. Again, a little more difficult with still photos and diagrams than with a uh, video, but that image of permeability of the muscles, looseness. Okay, connection. Again, the circle of the aids. And there's another illustration with more colors up there. But you also see on the purple line uh, on the underbelly of the horse, the thoracic sling is starting to be engaged also. So that's not only that the hind leg pushes, the neck softens, the back lifts, but the belly lifts also. So horses engage their core as the riders engage their core. So energy flows through the body, received in the hand. Contact is elastic and adjustable. And this is a nice phrase, fluent interaction between the horse and rider, which allows for appropriate changes in the horse's outline. So the shoulders to elevate as the hind legs lower. Acceptance of the bit. And we looked at that photo of Briar that he was soft. You could tell that he was softly chewing the bit. There wasn't um, evidence in the photo of the jaw being braced or the pole being locked. There was some nice foam on his mouth. His tongue was clearly in. Um, riding. You can test the horse you're riding or ask your student to test the horse uber striking, uh, release of the reins. So that used to be in a third level test where you would um, canter down the long side and release the inside, re release both reins to allow the horse to stay in balance when you release the reins. It was also in a test previously on a circle where you release just the inside rein to show that the reins were not holding the horse up, that the horse was balanced on the rider's seat, the rider could release the reins, the horse stayed in balance, stayed in the same rhythm. So the training scale was assessed there when that was being judged in a test. And it's something you can do in your riding, release the rein, does the horse stay where he was or does he leave? or change his position. The difference between Uberstreichen and chewing the reins out of the rider's hands. In Uberstreichen, the horse stays in the balance he's in with a softening of his body, but stays in the same outline. Chewing of the reins, the horse should stretch down long and low toward the bit, lowering the head. Okay. Faults in connection. Fault of this horse on this picture, you would call this horse low in the pole, 
and behind the vertical. Can't see the mouth, so you don't know what's happening with the mouth. Um, but that image of Breyer and then the diagram of the skeletal and muscular system of the rider and horse with the horse in the open throat latch and nose to the vertical. <clears throat> this riding deep and low, too low, held back. You can see that that neck is shortened and held in, can be damaging to the musculature of the horse's neck. And it's not true dressage if they cannot reach out to the contact. So stretching long and low to the bit, reaching to the ground is different than this. Okay, other faults. Horses can be too light in the hand, not taking the contact. Horse can be behind the bit and they can be behind the bit without necessarily being behind the vertical. It means that they're not taking the contact forward and they, you know, contract, as the word there, contract, they contract back. Above the bit, picture the gray horse in the walk photos with the lateral walk. Neck was clearly tense, back was clearly hollow, hind legs were straight, okay? So this is a cute picture, but the horse is above the bit, right? His under neck, the musculature of his under neck is prominent. And it's hard to tell in that photo with where the mane is and the light of it, but he probably looks like he might also have a dip in front of the withers from the under neck being used, not that rather than the top line being used. Okay. Against the bit, they look braced. Again, that musculature, when you look at the horse moving, is you can see bracing in the musculature. Heavy in the hands, it looks like if the rider gives, the horse will not stay in balance. Uneven contact, horse is stronger in one hand or too light in the other hand. Okay, uneven contact, generally caused by lack of straightness. And the next few slides will address straightness. But the horses should follow on one line of travel. Shoulders in front of hind legs, all four legs follow the, the same path. Watching the horse on the ground when you evaluate the horse can help you looking at the line of travel, can help you assess the straightness. Then need to figure out what exercises you need to do or what techniques you need to use with the riding to straighten the horse. Okay, impulsion. Again, hard to tell from a still photo, but from the engagement that you see in this horse's hindquarters, you would assume he has good impulsion. He's forward to the connection. This is a lovely, here's a good canter photo. Okay. So this would be beat one of the canter. The outside hind leg is clearly bearing the weight of the horse at this moment. It, the fetlock is flexed. He's sitting down on the outside hind leg and it captures it really well with that separation of the hind legs that we talked about. The spread, as the, the PowerPoint said, the spread, but the separation of the hind legs, that the inside hind leg is swinging well under the body of the horse. And look at where it steps. It steps under the rider's seat or boot or foot, right? That inside hind leg is clearly, clearly also going to bear weight when it, in the next second in the photo, when the horse, the, those feet hit the ground. And you can see that the inside hind leg is gonna hit the ground well, balance. And then that leading inside front leg is well up in the air. The nose is to the vertical. If you look at the shape of the horse's neck, not sure if this is a stallion or not, but the crest is a little high, but I wouldn't say that the horse is too low because his nose is nicely to the vertical and his hind leg is, both hind legs are in such good position. So that's a great canter photo showing the clear three beats of the photo of the horse of the canter and clear placement of the inside hind leg under. So that when you're watching a horse, watch for that inside hind leg swinging well under the barrel of the horse. Energy and thrust. And this is nice how she says, eager and energetic propulsive thrust that the horse looks happy, ready to go to work, happy to go to work energetically pushing forward, <clears throat> generated from behind and the athletic movement of the horse. That was a beautiful photo of the canter there. It looked very much, uh, very athletic. So the suspension, 
that airtime and that period of suspension is going to be after beat number three. But that amount of time that the horse was in the air there in the canter was clear. Again, a reminder that in the walk, there is no period of suspension because there's always a foot on the ground. One, two, three, four. There's always a foot on the ground. Thrust is measured by the horse's desire to carry himself forward. So a horse that's forward stays forward, stays in front of the leg. They look elastic. Again, that canter photo was very elastic. The back looked very supple. It was round. The rider was easily sitting softly. Engagement of the hindquarters in that the hindquarters were not only active, but carrying weight. This is a very uphill trot. Clear diagonal pairs. The outside hind is in the air, just about to hit the ground. So... To develop medium gates out of collected gates, thrust is necessary. More thrust for extended paces. And paces there meaning gates, okay? So not to be confused that a lateral walk can be called a pace. So when gates are called paces, that's not a negative term. It's just a term for gates. So the medium paces, the extended paces are and a good terminology to use. Impulsion. So this is a good photo for this also. Immediately after the hind leg pushes off the ground, the hock is energetically bent in a forward position. So the hock is swinging under the body. Okay, that hind leg that's in the air is gonna reach forward under the barrel of the horse. So there's a difference between action in a saddle seat type horse where the leg goes up and down and an activity in a dressage horse where the hind leg swings under the body. And you can clearly see that the forehand of those advanced dressage horses was were more elevated and in the air freedom. So that moment of suspension and this baby horse looks like he was going to have a stellar dressage career with that amount of suspension and natural freedom in his shoulder. So when a horse has good impulsion, the collection and collected and working gates become more pronounced. So it's the rhythm is clear. The activity of the joints is clear. The beat, the rhythm of each gate is clear. And they're able to go bigger in the lengthenings from the working gates, bigger in the collection and the extension from the collected gates. And I love that she refers back again to the circle of the age and the development of the muscle ring. And again, that development takes years to progress from the baby horse starting to the FEI horse competing. Straightness. Um, a common question is why does straightness come so far up the training scale? So this is actually, in order to read it in order, it's reversed. So the base is the rhythm, then the relaxation, then the con connection, then the impulsion, then the straightness. Because true straightness can't happen if the horse is not relaxed enough to take a good connection and does not have enough impulsion to push its body forward. And yes, we ride, try to ride a horse straight from the very beginning, but real true straightness that helps elevate the shoulders doesn't come until all of those ingredients are in there. Collection comes from straightness with improved balance and alignment, okay? Evaluating straightness when you watch a horse on the you're standing on the ground watching the horse. You look at the footfalls of the forehand and hindquarters. Are they on the same line? Horses are wider. So to straighten the horse's shoulders in front of the hindquarters is the job of the dressage rider to put the shoulders in front of the hindquarters, but that they travel on the same line of travel. 
So a horse should be straight on a straight line and straight on a curved line. So when you ride a circle or a corner or a serpentine, the hind legs should not swing out. The shoulders should not fall in. All four feet should be on the same line of travel. Horses are naturally crooked as are humans, right? And it's our job on a daily basis to assess our horse's straightness and our own straightness, okay? As the horse progresses, it becomes easier to ride them straight. They become more symmetrical. Every horse has a certain crookedness. Every horse has a natural stiff and hollow sides. And that sahal side, that's not a negative statement. That just, just is. It's easier to go one direction than another. Horses will have one side that they bend too much, one side that they're a little bit stiffer on. We use is the position of shoulder four to help the horse straighten the shoulders in front of the hind legs. So gymnastic exercises, working the horse equally both directions, making sure the hind legs take more weight, helps them develop the strength and the aids to prepare for collection. So a supple dressage horse should be supple both laterally, left to right, and longitudinally, back and forth, front to back. All right, assessing straightness. This is a pretty crooked person here, right? Uh, but you know what? It looks like their stirrup length is not too different. But this is very common, um, a rib cage that'll collapse to one side or the other, but it changes where the rider's weight is and how they influence the horse underneath them. So indicators, is the contact fairly even? Is one rein a lot stronger, one rein a lot lighter? Okay. Circles and voltes ride easily on both reins. So you turn a horse to the left, ride a 10 meter circle, turn the horse to the right, ride the 10 meter circle. You can feel the rider as the rider and you can see as the person on the ground, are they falling in, are they falling out? Look and sit behind the horse, stand behind the horse and look at the footfalls. Are the shoulders in falling in front of the hindquarters? Are the hindquarters following the shoulders? Right? And straight on a bent line is a really important concept to understand straightness on a curved line. So the line of travel. All right. And our ultimate goal is the collection to be able to have a horse that's engaged like this lovely stallion and in tune to his rider with a lowered croup and hind quarter and an elevated forehand. I think that's prettier than the... Um, medieval picture but this is our these are our predecessors in dressage but look at how much lower those hindquarters are and how elevated those shoulders are and the activity of the hind leg the sitting on the three joints of the hind leg on the sitting leg and the elevation on the leg that's in the air There's a canter pirouette picture, shows lowering of the haunches, turning, and the ability to turn the shoulders. So when they correctly lower the hindquarters and take, they take more weight on the hindquarters. And you can see that the center of gravity in this picture has shifted. Forehand has to get lighter to be able to make the pirouettes happen. And they go forward and both upward. Here's our piaffer again. And the musculature that changes in the hindquarters of the advanced horse versus the beginning horse. <clears throat> and there is, a, and if you look again at the picture of Briar, the power in his neck muscles actually helps raise the neck and pull, as well as the lowering of the croup and the pushing of the hindquarters. Okay, this is a fun one. Relative elevation. So relative elevation is the horse's hindquarters and shoulders, hindquarters lowered, shoulders elevated relative to the level of training. And this is clearly this horse working the cow. Look how far his hind leg is underneath his body. He has to be able to do that to be able to turn quickly. Okay, absolute elevation. Head carriage, not relative to the degree of engagement. So clearly the under muscles of that horse are pushing upward to lift the shoulders rather than the hind leg supporting. And remember, um, 
when I said about the difference between activity and action. This horse has a lot of action versus activity. So you see that his bent hind leg is outside hind leg is up in the air, but the hind leg's not swinging under the barrel like the dressage horse was, okay? And certain breeds are, are bred to do this showy type of trot. Um, and here it's shown that it's created by the, ride, the handler on the ground, right? With the stick and the bridle, getting the neck up to get the shoulders off the ground. So we want to, as dressage riders, get the back up to get the shoulders off the ground, not get the neck up. And the teapot is a good analogy. It looks like a teapot. And it's hard to see with the hair, but remember how the horses in Good Piaf had a lower croup? Again, it's hard to see with the hair, but it says that this horse's withers are lower than the croup. That's the teapot pasture. Okay, good collection. What we strive for, developed through the training, use of the half halts, the driving aids, suppling exercises. So the shoulder and the half pass, trying to make them equal both directions, riding the horse forward from the very beginning. Forward straight helps develop the uphill. And then the test is, can they be ridden on the seat and the aids become light? Mistakes in collection. Too strong in the bridle, not enough hind leg pushing. There's an interesting phrase there. The lion in front and the mouse behind. That's an interesting. Riding front to back rather than back to front. And if you look at the arrows on this, slightly different than the arrows, see the white outline of the horse in the back had the pole elevated and the nose forward and <clears throat> less rigidity in the shoulders. You look at the white legs versus the solid dark legs. And also the solid dark leg is open out the back, okay? That's an indicator that the hind leg is not enough engaged. It's more open out the back. Look at the inside hind, it's not swinging under the barrel or stepping in the print of the front foot like the white horse on the, the image in the back. Okay. Um, Durchlassig kite, so again, like permeability um, without resistance, um, suppleness, throughness, lots of different ways to express that. But you can see that this horse is not braced. He has good elevation of his shoulders without being braced in the contact. The rider sitting deep and the horse is carrying the rider. Oh, I think we're at the end, Mary. We are back to the beginning. So we are at 812 and I'm glad to take any questions we might have, Mary. Okay, great. Um, so We'll give everybody a minute. Um, and maybe you could just talk a little bit about, so you went through the pyramid. How would you apply this like in day-to-day -day training? Okay, so in assessing the horse, start in the warm-up. Relaxation and rhythm are a little bit hand in hand. That as you loosen the horse and work through its basic gates, walk, trot, canter, you keep a good steady rhythm. If you find that the horse tense, tight in the back. You might use your lateral bending exercises depending on the level of the horse, which exercises to use. But I will often do some basic serpentines with the horse after warming up the trot a little bit. If they're a little tight in the back before cantering, I'll do some basic serpentines, whether a shallow serpentine, a three loop serpentine, a four loop serpentine, or a series of half circles to, and I really like an exercise that we call the bow tie, where we do a 15 meter half circle from the end of the ring to the middle of the long side, and then do the same in the other direction. So you're working the horse on a right 15 meter half circle, diagonal back to the middle of the long side, then a left 15 meter half circle, diagonal back. And you can really assess in that half circle, the bending, the straight line between the two half circles, the straightness, and it's a simple suppling exercise that works for a lot of horses at a lot of different levels. And as you progress in the warm up, you can also do it in the canter, canter a half circle, 
go across the short diagonal, ride a simple change through the trot or depending on the level of the horse through the canter, but in the basic warm up, walk trot canter. Um, so finding exercises that work for you, your horse, your student, the arena that you're in, the situation, the any other of the variable variables of weather, any distractions, but um, exercise basic exercises in your first initial warm up that help the horse become relaxed, help the horse become straight, help the horse develop a connection, and then riding transitions in that warm up, you can assess your degree of a forwardness impulsion. You can improve the connection with the use of the transitions. And again, uh, on the serpentine or on the half circles, the riding transitions, even simple trot, walk, trot, um, can help the horse push more equally from behind and help the rider become straight. And having um, an exercise gives the rider a point to ride to. When they have a point to ride to, they tend to ride straighter. Does that help, Mary? Yes, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> more questions. Um, how often should you do Überstreichen in training? As often as you need it. <laughs> okay, it's a good idea to check it daily or if you just did a difficult exercise and you want to be sure that the horse is relaxing or in the exercise or is relaxed in the work. Or if you feel that the horse might be getting tense and backing off the contact, releasing the hands forward to encourage the horse to open their, their frame a little bit is helpful. So it's, I'd say as often as needed, but it, it is good to do each day in each gate, at least to check. Is he, is the horse where I'd like him to be? Is he on my seat and in front of my leg without running, without running through the bridle, without falling on the forehand, without changing the tempo, when you release the reins. Okay. Um, what sort of exercises do you recommend for a horse that prefers action over activity? Transitions, um, because uh, you'll get a bending hind leg in both the down transition and the up transition can help you improve the pushing power. And then even transitions within the gate, um, working trot to a shorter trot, collected trot to a shorter trot to a medium trot back to collect. And they don't have to be a uh, lengthening or a medium that goes the entire long side or the entire diagonal. It can be just, hey, hey, three or four strides, even on the short side, get out in front of my leg, stay out in front of my leg. So transitions, I think, are really key to teaching the horse and the rider to engage with the hind leg underneath the body. And it develops strength and pushing power because if they're ridden correctly, leg to hand, hand to seat, back to front, the horse develops the understanding of sitting in the transitions. And Where do you back, oh. forward, back between exercises too, sorry. Okay. Where do you find that most horses get stuck on the training scale? It's often a huge jump from first level to second level because they, and you know, that's from working gates to collected gates. That's often a, a cutoff for some horses. Um, and then the change to third level because the difference between medium and extended paces. So those are two big stepping stone places for horses that will tell you, help you, you know, are they going to be able to continue, can keep continuing through the levels of training, or are there things that they might need more time to develop that strength? And then later on, when you have a good solid pre-St. George I-1 horse, there's that's a huge jump from intermediate one to intermediate two and then to Grand Prix. You know, adding in the Piaf and Passage and adding in the ability to sit for the full pirouettes and the ability to do the one tempies. So I'd say for the lower level horses, the step between first and second level, and then the step between second and third level. And then for the FEI horses, the step from St. George I-1, the small tour horses to the Intermediate II and the Grand Prix. Where do you feel riders struggle with the pyramid of training? I think it depends on the situation, the rider, the horse, the trainer. But I would say straightness is a daily 
maybe not struggle, but straightness is has to be addressed <clears throat> daily, maintaining the impulsion. Um, and then when horse, when they're pushing a horse to a next letter level or strengthening the horse to the next level, maintaining that relaxation, because without the relaxation, it really just is not really good dressage without the relaxation. But straightness is a daily job. Okay. Uh, looks like just a couple more. Um, what exercises do you recommend to help a horse that is too light in the bridle? If they're not forward enough, the forward and back transitions between the gates, within the gates. If they are not trusting the contact, not reaching to the contact, I would say frequently stretching long and low. So not waiting to only stretch the horse at the end of the ride but between the phases. So if you've done some good trot work, stretch the horse, even if it's an advanced horse, a, a horse you're bringing up through the FEI levels, the stretching over the back is so helpful for them, for their muscle development, their relaxation mentally and physically. And if you can get them to take the bridle in the stretch down, that is a huge help. If they will stay, if they're in a double bridle, they'll they'll push into the snaffle bridle, snaffle bit as they do the stretching down. Really important for developing the back and the trust and that that communication. So I'd say transitions again between the gates within the gates, but using the stretch circle frequently through the ride, not saving it for just the end of the ride. Um. Can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, new wording or some of the interchangeable wording between like suppleness and relaxation, contact and connection? Okay. Contact and connection. So contact, you're looking at how the horse takes the bridle and how the rider takes the bridle. So if you're looking at the rider, if they're a little braced in the arms or shoulders or back, that affects the contact. Where the connection is the circle of the age, the image of the circle of the age, that there's that pushing from behind, the lifting of the back, the engagement of the thoracic sling, the reach to the contact and that a quiet half fault brings that energy back to the hind leg and it's recycled. You know, the leg to hand, hand to seat, the energy is continually recycled is the connection where contact, if you're looking just at contact is how does, how does the horse and the rider take the bridle? And I'm sorry, what was the first question? Suppleness and relaxation. So, a horse can be relaxed and happy and still stiff. They don't usually mind that they're stiff. <laughs> okay. um, they can be not equally supple left and right and happy and relaxed. They'll stretch down, but they'll stretch down differently the two directions. They'll be uneven. They might be uneven in the rain contact in both directions, but they're relaxed. Um, I'm not sure if that's too simple. An explanation, but if you look at on the pyramid there, the relaxation is with elasticity and suppleness. So the elasticity, I like to use that permeability, that back to front, again, the circle of the aids and suppleness, lateral suppleness, left and right, that there's no bracing when they're suppled left and right, but they can be in a relaxed, mental, happy place and still be a little stiffer right than left. Hopefully the relaxation, the lateral exercises have encourage the horse to step into the rein that they might be hollow on, but um, their the horse can be mentally relaxed and not be completely supple, but suppleness as you develop the horse should create a more symmetrical horse, which helps you create a straighter horse. So I'm not sure if I answered that completely. So if I didn't, if the person who wrote it wants to respond back, I'm glad to delve into that more or from a different perspective. Okay. Um, and then, well, I guess while they're thinking about that, um, how can, what's a good way for a rider to tell if they're crooked? Mm -hmm. Video. 
video is very good. Riding into mirrors. I like to talk to my mirrors every day. Um, video and like the use of, if you don't have a human to help you, the use of a PIVO is great. I mean, there's limitations to it, but being videoed from the back and from the front as well as the side, because riding away, you can more often see asymmetry in the rider, um, special levelness of the hip or height of the one hip or the other hip and uh, you know eyes on the ground but if you have are working on your own any way you can set up a video uh right if you don't have mirrors set up a video um if i'm riding without mirrors outdoors i'll try to look at the shadows but then of course you lean over to look at it so um straightness for the rider checking that you're stepping equally into both stirrups um I will often tell my students, it's okay to look at your hands once in a while. You know, yes, we're supposed to look up and where we're going, but if you look down at your hands, you can see if one hand is higher than the other hand. So visuals are, and then feel of straightness or evenness when you sit and ride a transition, especially a down transition, say parallel to the wall. Do you have weight in both seat bones? Do you have weight in both stirrups? Do you have equal weight in both reins? So self-assessment for those riding on their own in or in between lessons. If you don't have use of a video, self-assessment daily. Can I make this transition straight, equal on both seat bones, equal in both stirrups, equal in both reins on the wall or parallel to the wall? So the wall maybe is a lot helping, but not really supporting the horse at the rider can feel they can put the horse on their seat. Okay, I think that about wraps it up. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. And sharing all the